Stan Jibalisco here to talk a little bit about a phenomenon no known as characteristic impedance having to do with transmission lines and in particular radio frequency transmission lines. What you see here is a very simple diagram of a theoretical ideal situation. Here's your transmitter, say a ham radio transmitter. Here's your transmission line. It might be a parallel wire line. It might be a coaxial line. It might even be a waveguide. But in this uh, idealized scenario, it extends forever. The spacing between these conductors remains constant, and in fact, the transmission line maintains its the same characteristics, the same <laughs> the same uh, configuration, geometry, and construction, on and on and on forever and ever and ever until ultimately the loss in the wires will cause the current in the transmission line to fall to zero and it'd be just like you're sending an electromagnetic field out along this line and it just goes on and on and on. Now imagine that ideal scenario and imagine there is a certain current flowing in this line. The current, radio frequency current, flows in opposite directions on in either wire of the line but we can measure that current nevertheless in amperes and let's just say that that current in amperes is abbreviated as I, which uh, stands for intensity, I learned. It's a French word for intensity. That's where the I for current as a variable comes from. But let's just say you have a certain current, I, flowing in these conductors. Between the conductors, you have a certain voltage, E, electromotive force, in volts, radio frequency volts. It's a potential difference between these two wires at every point along the line. We're going to find that the current remains the same and the voltage remains the same except for gradual decline because of losses in the line. But the ratio E divided by I voltage divided by current or volts divided by amps. This ratio will always be the same and that ratio is what we call the characteristic impedance of the line. In a parallel wire transmission line typically the ratio of E to I is on the range of 300 to 600 and because we're dividing volts by amps that normally in a DC circuit gives us resistance in ohms so we also can refer to the characteristic impedance of a transmission line as a value in ohms. Now that is an idealized situation. Let's just suppose for a moment though that we have a 600 ohm transmission line. 600 ohm characteristic impedance parallel wire transmission line. And let's say that instead of extending that thing forever, which in practical terms of course is impossible, we terminate that line in a non-inductive, non-reactive resistor of 600 ohms. When we do that we're going to get the exact same 600 ratio of voltage to current all along this line. At every point along the line that ratio is always going to be the same and depending on how much power we put into that line in terms of transmitter radio frequency output that'll determine the actual voltage and current. Uh, we might say, for example, uh, oh, we might have six volts and then uh, what would uh, the current be? You, you tell me. <laughs> six volts divided by uh, 600. 600 volts, one amp, but that's a heck of a lot of power there if you have that kind of a, of a scenario. But 
In any case, if we terminate a characteristic impedance transmission line, certain characteristic impedance, say 600 ohms, if we terminate that in a resistance equal to the characteristic impedance, we will get a scenario where we have uniform current and voltage along that line. But that's the only scenario that we can possibly have where that uniformity, that uniformity of the ratio in the current and the voltage will be that way. That is known as a one-to-one -one standing wave ratio because there are no standing waves on the line. The uh, intensity remains flat all along the line. So we have an SWR of 1 to 1. The actual definition of standing wave ratio in mathematical terms is kind of esoteric. Sometime maybe I'll get into that. But we could have any other kind of line, a coaxial line, maybe a 50 ohm characteristic impedance instead. That would have to be coaxial cable then and symbolized like this and one side shielded. And the resistance instead of 600 ohms would be only 50 ohms in order to get that idealized situation. So that is wh uh, what we call characteristic impedance. And every transmission line that you buy or make has a particular characteristic impedance and it's listed as one of the specifications. The lowest characteristic impedance you're likely to see in practical applications is coaxial cable with a 50 ohm or 52 ohm characteristic impedance. The highest that you're likely to see is an open wire line with about 600 ohms. And that's assuming that there are very few spacers and the wire, you know, insulating dielectric spacers and the wire is relatively small diameter spaced quite a ways apart. Very difficult to get any kind of characteristic impedance higher than 600 ohms or lower than 50 ohms. Stan Jabalisco signing off. Until next time, so long.